Good evening, and thank you for joining us for Dr. Levy's webinar, Fluorescence Imaging and Da Vinci Endometriosis Resection Procedures. I am Claire Pomeroy, a GYN Marketing Manager for Intuitive Surgical. Dr. Levy is one of the most experienced Da Vinci gynecologic surgeons. His practice is exclusively dedicated to managing chronic pelvic pain and complicated benign gynecologic surgery. Dr. Levy has been a faculty member of the NYU Langone Medical Center since 2001. While at NYU, he founded the Bellevue Hospital Chronic Pelvic Pain Clinic. He is also the founder and director of the New York Pelvic Pain and Minimally Invasive Gynecologic Surgery Group. A group of subspecialty physicians focused on multidisciplinary approaches to diagnose and manage women with chronic pelvic pain. Starting with robotic surgery in 2007, Dr. Levy has completed 450 cases with the Da Vinci surgical system. I will now turn it over to Dr. Levy to explain how he uses Da Vinci for endometriosis resection and when he includes the use of Firefly. Thank you, Claire. So I want to thank everyone for coming to join us this evening. I know everyone has a very busy schedule. Um, some of you probably just got out of the operating room and some of you may be in between surgical cases. This is my very first webinar. I'm far more accustomed to speaking to groups of people in actual rooms while they're eating a steak and drinking some wine. That's more, my, that's more along the line of my experience in my wheelhouse, so bear with me while I make it through my very first webinar. But in order to make this a more interactive experience so I wouldn't think that I was just talking into my computer, which is sort of what I'm doing right now in our virtual room. I've put up some questions for, for the team working with me to give to you during my talk, so at least I know you guys are out there. So please do me a favor and answer those questions. It would really be helpful. The second thing I'd like to let you know is that during the surgical videos, typically when I give a presentation, I ask people to ask me, take, that, take time to ask me the questions that they have on their mind about the surgery that's actually being done on that video. I've made my surgical videos a little bit longer than your typical two, two to three minute videos. Some of them go up to five minutes. So it gives us plenty of time to talk about the surgery and ask and answer questions. So as we move through today's conversation, I'd like to build a story about how I look at patients with chronic pelvic pain and endometriosis and how I kind of think about taking them to the operating room or not taking them to the operating room. I'd like to talk about how we select chronic pelvic pain patients for surgery. We're going to talk about how I like to set up the da Vinci as I move through developing a consistent approach towards managing endometriosis. And we'll also talk about my surgical technique for endometriosis. And I know most of you probably came this evening to talk about Firefly, and we're certainly not going to leave that out for the last, say, 20% of the conversation tonight. So there's a question up there. Thank you for taking some time to answer it. Um, so let me give you a little bit of information about my background. My, my practice is exclusively focused on taking care of women with chronic pelvic pain and performing minimally invasive surgery since I started at NYU 13 years ago. I've done about six or 700 da Vinci cases, although I think I probably stopped counting. Since case about 125 to 150, I've had this all-in mentality. I do all of my surgeries with the da Vinci. And I know Intuitive talks about this aha moment, but I'd like to present it to you as an aha transition. Because what's really happening during that time, as you accrue enough cases and enough time sitting in front of the robot, what's really going on is your brain and spinal cord and your muscles start behaving properly to become true da Vinci robotic surgeons. You felt awkward in your first couple of cases because you had no neuromuscular memory for this technique. If you recall, it's probably the same way you felt during your first laparotomy and maybe even during your first laparoscopy. So now you have a third technique on here which is a little bit different from what you've been doing and that's going to help you develop and, and having that neuromuscular memory is what makes you feel very comfortable with the robot. So the first question, so it looks like about uh, Dan is going to put up the results there. So it looks like about 85% of people on the call are currently using the da Vinci to perform gynecologic surgery, which is great. So I know I'm talking to a group of people that are on the same page as me. So just, kinda, just to kind of build this conversation about chronic pelvic pain and endometriosis and then moving into how we use Firefly, I just kind of want to give you the way I think about chronic pelvic pain. As you know, it's a three or months more in duration. It can be cyclic or continuous. And located in the abdomen and pelvis, I like to tell people from the iliac crest to the ischial tuberosities from a bony standpoint. And if you think of that in anatomic terms, then you've probably got um, most of your chronic abdominal pelvic pain fairly well defined. 
from an anatomic standpoint. A critical concept, as we again sort of build this thinking about why we're taking patients to the operating room and thinking about chronic pelvic pain and endometriosis, are the concepts of central sensitization and neuroplasticity. And if you're taking care of women with chronic pelvic pain, it's really important for you to have an understanding of these concepts. Central sensitization is the concept where central circuits become overreactive. Thus, they start producing spontaneous and, and really ectopic impulses. So that anterior cingular cortex, which is normally quiescent and really good at suppressing pain, when there's, when there's very little pain, becomes sort of an active body in actually creating pain. The concept of neuroplasticity is what we're thinking about when we're thinking about how do we change pain? How do we make patients better? That's the concept that says persistent or mo with persistent moderate to severe pain can lead to changes in both the structure and transmission of pain in the brain and spinal cord. So the way your spinal thalamic tract in, the, in your spine communicates with your brain actually changes from a neurotransmitter standpoint and from an anatomic standpoint. And we think about, when we think about why we're taking patients to the operating room, we're thinking about how do we, how and what can we do to reverse this neuroplastic change. There are three main types of pain that we think about, speaking practically. There are somatic pain, which is that muscle, ligament, bone, or tendon, body type pain. And then there's visceral pain, which you think about mostly in gynecology, right, which is bowel, bladder, ovaries, ureters, fallopian tubes. Um, vaginal pain is a visceral type pain. And then there's a the neuropathic pain, which I'll tell you that is probably the most critical type of pain that we could have in patients with endometriosis, especially when it comes to that sort of crossover between visceral and neuropathic type pain and endometriosis. All three coexist in almost all of the patients I see in the office. So I'm going to give you a little bit of insight into why I think that it's better to operate on these patients as a first line. Uh, in spite of classic teaching rather than to treat them medically for a very long period of time. Spinal windup is, is what allows central sensitization to occur. So the more spinal windup you have, the more hits of that spinal windup you have, the more likely you are to have long-term central sensitization. Um, so I think we have another question coming up. Um, spinal inflammation is also a critical concept in endometriosis. Spinal inflammation has been shown to exist in animal models. Um, COX-2 is at very high levels in the dorsal horn. When you give patients medical therapy for endometriosis, you're not suppressing that spinal inflammation. What you're doing it is allow it to pro proliferate while you, while you take care of some of the broader, bigger picture pain, but that spinal inflammation still exists. And what happens when that spinal inflammation still exists is you're setting the patient up for, refra for refractory chronic pain development vis-a-vis -vis neuroplasticity and central sensitization. At the same time, you're also potentially setting the patient up for psychiatric disease, development of other comorbidities. Medi medical therapies have, as we know, side effects uh, that can be certainly damaging on the long term but are mostly inconvenient and uncomfortable on the short term. But most importantly, medical therapy has poor long-term outcomes. So if you stop the, whatever medication you've put the patient on, then the, more, the likelihood is that you're going to wind up with the patient having pain return in a very short period of time. So great, we have, a, we have a, a, an answer to the, this question that really, really makes me feel good. It says, that, uh, Dan, you can go ahead and put up the results. It says a lot of my colleagues are thinking about endometriosis in both a multidisciplinary and multimodal fashion. So you're bringing in medical and surgical therapy and you're bringing in colleagues to consult with and you're bringing in psychiatrists and rheumatologists and gastroenterologists. That's great to hear. So well, one of the easy things in my practice is that I have a chronic pelvic pain referral practice. So it's really very simple for me to kind of choose surgical candidates. Everyone says, oh yeah, of course you have a 97% rate of finding endometriosis. All your patients have endometriosis. That's what you get in your office. But we have a framework, believe it or not, for actually figuring out who to take to the operating room and who not to take to the operating room, which is why I think the rates of finding endometriosis are so high in the office. But I think this is an important framework if you're doing OB and GYN and you have sort of a, of a of a broader based practice from a disease standpoint. Um, so I'll, I'll give you these kind of three categories. The standard 101 surgical candidates should be the easiest for everyone to figure out whether or not to take to the operating room. Those are the patients that have a long history of dysmenorrhea, especially the teen dysmenorrhea leading to psychosocial dysfunction, those with infertility, and those with dis deep dyspareunia, the classic triad. That should give you, and I hope my medical students and residents can tell me about this, but that should give you about a 5.2 relative risk of having endometriosis. 
Then there's the next group of patients, which I like to call the obvious surgical candidates, the ones that you sort of don't really need a gold embossed invitation to take to the operating room. Those are the patients who have endometriomas with pain. Um, and in those patients who don't have pain with endometriomas, you can defer surgical management in our practice. If there's no pain, the masses are stable. That really only works well for premenopausal women. Postmenopausal women uh, with endometriomas need to have surgery, and, and especially if they're new. And, and we've, we've, we've been referring those patients all out to gynecologic oncology. We rarely, rarely see such a patient. Um, and then the second group of obvious surgical candidates are those with deep infiltrating disease. Evidence on exam might be some severe uterosacral ligament nodularity, the rectovaginal septum mass, a fr the obvious frozen pelvis, and we see about twice a year patients with through and through uh, vaginal lesions. And those are an important group of patients uh, to want to take to the operating room for pain. Uh, the obvious surgical candidates with deep infiltrating endometriosis imaging, uh, that we frequently do rectal ultrasound with or without an MRI with rectal contrast. Most, some of the times we're doing, uh, we're doing both. You know, a lot of people, you know, in the past have done colonoscopy, you know, before these surgeries. I, you know, we've gotten away from that for a number of years now, and I, I, I don't really think it offers significant benefit. Uh, you know, you may, there may be some hyperemia or mass effect that's seen in the anterior rectal uh, wall or distal sigmoid colon, anterior wall. Um, but for the most part, you're going to see it on your imaging studies. The only time we really get colonoscopy anymore in chronic pelvic pain patients is when they have alarm symptoms, hematochezia, or you're looking to rule out, you know, you know, IBD, ulcerative colitis, or Crohn's. So, and th then there's this next category. I call this the 401, like the senior, like the senior college student level classes. Um, these are the more subtle cases. These are the ones that are more difficult to figure out to take to the operating room. Um, so I always tell people, forget what you've been taught about the correlation between the lack of dysmenorrhea and endometriosis. Everyone, I, I hear this all too often. That, well, she doesn't have dysmenorrhea, thus, thus there's no endometriosis. Nothing could be further from the truth. There's no clear pattern to pain and endometriosis. I have a tremendous number of patients in the practice who have pain throughout a typical 30-day period, and then they get their menstrual cycle, they start to bleed, and their pain improves significantly. So there's really no clear correlation um, between pain pattern in endometriosis in these more difficult to figure out patients. These patients, uh, some of the items in the history that you may want to pay careful attention to, again, I find T. dysmenorrhea with or without psychosocial dysfunction very, very important. Long history of birth control pills, birth control pill use, they recently stopped and now the patient has severe pain. And that's particularly common in patients that I see who've had bad, bad teen dysmenorrhea. They were put on birth control pills for a number of years. Now they're 26 or 27, and they want to consider getting pregnant. They go off the birth control pills, and ouch, now it starts to hurt. Well, that's a really good evidence of that refractory sort of chronic pain you set up, because now they don't just have dysmenorrhea. They have pain every day. Um, and then there's the group of patients that have increasing pain with subsequent pregnancies. I did an OBGYN residency just like, you know, probably everyone else on this webinar, and I don't know where our educators got the idea to tell us that if patients have endometriosis, you should tell them to get pregnant and they'll probably get better. Well, that may work okay for the actual pregnancy, because why would anyone get pregnant if they had severe pain? And I would probably die off as a species. but. Endometriosis is an estrogen responsive disease, and if you give somebody super physiologic doses of thousands of times normal physiologic levels of estrogen, the endometriosis is going to get worse, and that's what I see clinically in a lot of patients. So some of these patients, you know, physical exam is rarely completely normal, mostly a subtle finding of some mild posterior fornix thinking, mild uterocycle ligament tenderness. Sometimes you get CMT if you push the cervix forward, um, and, and sometimes you get lucky and get a little bit of deviation of the cervix. The imaging in these patients is almost always normal. All right. So... Let's just uh, move on and talk about the surgical uh, approach. So Daniel's put up another question. Uh, if you could respond to that, that would be fantastic as we start to talk about um, how we're approaching surgery uh, in these patients. The critical thing in surgery with these patients, is, which I'll come back to time and time again, is the question of reproducibility and how we're moving through these cases with this, in the same exact fashion every single time. 
preoperatively, I'm always setting up expectations for the length of surgery and outcomes that gives the patient and their family a really good idea of what's going to happen. I always bowel prep, and I know what the literature says. And if you're one of my residents, you're probably like yelling. You're probably going to yell at me for this, but. Uh, in my personal experience, doing these cases with a bowel prep and the robot is makes life a whole a whole lot easier. So I'm glad to see that most people uh, on this webinar are already working with the Da Vinci to remove endometriosis. So I think everyone's on the same, hopefully on the same page as me. Hopefully in my uh, sort of in my um, in my experiential wheelhouse here, and uh, we'll uh, we'll hopefully convince the other group of people why it's a good idea to use some of this technology for removing endometriosis. I always show the patients images of planned incisions. Again, some of these surgeries are very complicated. If you have a patient with deep infiltrating endometriosis, you really want to line up your ducts. The, I always tell patients there is a possibility of a laparotomy. The old literature says it's 10 to 15 percent. In, and this is Chaperone's group uh, from the 90s uh, in deep infiltrating endometriosis. We've really approached close to 0 percent you know, in modern day laparoscopy uh, for advanced endometriosis cases. Patients should know that there's an increased risk of bowel and lower urinary tract injury. I, I quote around the in the I quote in the five percent range from the literature. And then you know the last part is you know we're, I'm very fortunate at NYU and not everyone has this at their center, but I'm very fortunate at NYU to have a really nice relationship with colorectal surgeons and urologists who are trained in robotic surgery. So I can always give them a buzz even in the middle of a case. I rarely need them, but when I do know ahead of time that I'm going to need them, I make sure they're going to be available and they've seen the patient in the office ahead of time. Again, the surgical approach has to be reproducible. It doesn't have to be reproducible for me. Your own surgical approach, you have to be able to do it the same way every single time. And, and no one else has to be able to reproduce your surgical approach. But I will tell you that there are a lot of cogs in the wheel here. And there are a lot of things going on, especially with these complicated cases. And it's easy to bounce from left to right. And I see less experienced surgeons doing that when I review videos. But I, I, I try to tell people to find a focus and direct yourself through this anatomy because it can be really hard. For the setup, I use the same draping, the same placement of gear every single time. I use the Da Vinci every time with four arms, uh, standardize my port placements, which I'll show you on the next slide. Every time I side dock, um, the reason I side dock is because if I need access to the rectum, uh, the vagina, or, or urethra, I'm, I'm, it's easy to get with a side dock. I use the same uterine manipulator, uh, a, a Pelosi uterine manipulator, and I do my smoke evacuation and pneumo insufflation the same way every single time with a Surgiquest. And I, 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 this is the last time I'll mention this during this talk, but if you don't have one of those devices at your hospital, I would recommend at least getting someone to come in and demo it because it will change your view of, of, of speed and efficiency in robotic surgery. So this is my, this is my you know, planned incision set. Um, we stopped using this right upper 12 millimeter incision. Surgiquest has provided us with now a new 5 millimeter <clears throat> um, port with which we uh, recently started using at NYU. But certainly these incisions, and you know, we're talking about endometriosis today, so Almost no matter how severe the disease, these, these are going to be the incisions, but certainly for large anatomy, if you're doing large myomectomies or 22-week size uterus, then that, that has to change a little bit. So for all of my chronic pelvic pain patients, I do the same set of procedures provided they're planning to get pregnant in the future. Uh, it's an appendectomy, the lumbar sympathectomy, do a fertility sparing radical resection of endometriosis, do cystoscopy, and finish up with a chromatobation. So once I get into the once I once I get in once I'm looking inside with the scope I start off with a careful inspection once we're docked I start off with my appendectomy mobilizing the cecum leads to a very simple right sidewall dissection once that once that retroperitoneal space is open do a 35 millimeter endo GIA followed by an endo catch lumbar sympathectomy done in a very standard fashion with the robot just the same way we do it with the 2D scope five to six centimeter vertical window in the posterior abdominal wall peritoneum just below the aortic bifurcation going to move three to four trunks and mostly on the left. Um, I go from there um, to mobilize the sigmoid colon. Now remember I started right now I'm moving from right to the middle to left. Um, at this point uh, we're at this point, if, I, if there's not a lot of disease, I'm going to take a closer look in the pelvis with ICG and Firefly, which we'll be talking about shortly. Um, at, if needed at this point, I'm going to manage my endometriomas because the kissing endometriomas never help you get further into the pelvis, so you really need to get them out of your way. 
Um, I'll ident again, going down the left side, I'll identify the ureter all the way down to the cardinal ligament by dissecting it free from its retroperitoneal fibrosis, dissecting the peritoneum and deeper lesions around to normal tissue, inferiorly down to the level of the uterine vessels, anterolaterally through the ovarian fossa, medially to lesions in the midline. Uh, anytime I'm operating on endometriosis medial to the uterosacral ligaments, I'm using an EEA sizer and a uterine manipulator. I really want to know where my distal sigmoid colon and proximal rectum lie, and using those, using that EEA sizer really helps you out to get yourself into the rectovaginal septum and define a plane. Uh, just repeat on the left what I did on the right, then move forward and resect the anterior disease, chromotubate, do my cystoscopy, closing back, back to the peritoneal cavity and close like a very standard laparoscopic procedure. And that's how I approach endometriosis every single time. It doesn't matter if the patient has terrible disease or the patient has really no problem disease. So the next question is, so we have this large group of people working on endometriosis. I'm curious to see how many people are really aggressively removing some of that retroperitoneal disease. We'll take, we'll take a look at that before we go on to our uh, surgical video, our first video. Great. It looks like about 50-50. So I hope some of the video I show you, maybe not all of it in this talk, but maybe we can come back and do a live surgery where we show you, you know, how nice it is to operate in the retroperitoneum uh, with the robot and how much easier it, it will probably make your life to use this technique. So let's start off, uh, we're going to go to the first video, uh, which is going to be a fairly standard endometriosis resection. And again, so that he's opened up a Q&A box. So feel free to go ahead and ask me some questions if you have any uh, about the video during the video or any questions uh, you might have uh, in general. My first disclaimer about these videos is that the quality will never be as good as what I see in the robot. I'm seeing in 3D. You're, you're seeing uh, in 2D. Um, so you can see what kind of, you know, I'm squeezing the uterus there, and I, we can talk about haptic feedback later. Um, you can see there on the right side, that's a pretty obvious scarred endometriosis lesion. You don't, you know, there's not too much experience there to be able to tell that that's what's going on. The... Um, what you can also see down here, I'll, I'll grab my arrow here, what you can also see down here is some area of hypervascularity. We're just starting off up here, you know, dissecting out the uh, left ureter, and, and already the sigmoid colon's been mobilized. We've done our appy and our lumbar sympathectomy. So that's all going to be kind of, you know, standard fare. Dr. Uh, Dr. Pack has asked the question, what's my hemostatic choice? Uh, for these cases. I'm going to use, you know, tis seal or flow seal depending on, you know, what goes on often uh, during the surgery when there's some continued bleeding, especially if it's coming from the ovary or, um, you know, broadly dissected peritoneal surfaces that are oozing. I'm going to wind up putting a cottonoid uh, there during the surgery because I know I have, you know, at least an hour or two more surgery to go and cottonoid's really effective um, just to put some pressure in the area. I can always remove that at the end of the case. Again, just going down on the left side here, and it's you know really nice to uh, be able to use the Da Vinci here for uh, for removing some of that uh, endometriosis. And I know the ureter is out of the way. I can just take what looks like normal tissue, and, and the, so the principle of this of this whole you know how do we remove and what do we how do we remove endometriosis and what are we you know what are we doing is to get down to norm, is to get down to normal tissue. Um, one of the nice things we could do is get right on top of the vessels. You'll see a, a branch of the uterine vein, you know, kind of sitting right there. And we can just get right on top of those vessels and, and dissect. Um, uh, often people ask me uh, when they're seeing these videos or what are my um, settings. Uh, I'm going to put my, um, in quotes, monopolar and then um, cut setting at, at 90 watt cutting power on on um, on a pure cut, and a lot of people think that's high, but what it offers me uh, is the uh, is a way to, to make these uh, little fine cuts without um, creating uh, significant tissue spread, which I don't want when I'm operating over the uh, uh, over the ureter. So it makes life a little bit uh, easier for me. And again, I'm just kind of you know I'm seeing some areas of retroperitoneal fibrosis, which I sometimes come back to at the end of a case. And what else do we need to do? So you certainly want to give things a double look over. And when things are when things are tight like that, when things are um, sort of pulling very easily, I know that I haven't gotten all the tissue. And I really need to come back and get a little closer to the ureter. You'll also notice nothing's really bleeding back here. That says to me that there's a fairly significant amount of scar tissue that needs to be dissected. So we're kind of going to go over this and take off the superficial stuff and potentially come back and go off, 
go after some of the deeper deeper disease. And if you saw here, this whole area was that hypervascular area, which please remember for the end of the talk, endometriosis is a highly vascular disease and uh, it needs to be uh, thought of as such. So again, I got to go around the uterocircal ligament here. And you'll see in a moment, um, you'll, you'll see in just a moment how we kind of put the EEA sizer in and that's going to make life a lot easier for getting into that area of the rectal vaginal septum. Part of, part of reproducibility in these cases is having an excellent, excellent surgical assistant, uh, certainly someone that can find the pelvis quite easily. So now this is the uh, next part of the case. We've kind of got our EEA sizer in here, my surgical assistant, uh, who, by the way, is, is like 97 pounds um, and 4 foot 11 and somehow, winds, winds, and somehow manages to... Uh, to uh, suction, grab specimens, and work the EEA sizer all at the same time. But it really defined, it really defined the tissue for me, right? It really defined the colon. So I know that I, I know that I've got this nice this lesion, and I'm pulling it away from the colon. It, without having that EEA sizer in, it's a complete mystery where how I'm getting into the pararectal space and how I'm getting into the rectovaginal septum. There's really no good way to tell. And then you know, unfortunately, you, you don't want to. First, decide that you're uh, that you're near the colon when you see the uh, when you see the colonic mucosa. That's a bad time to figure it out. So again, you know, doing our best here to remove you know maximal amounts of maximal amounts of tissue. And this so this will be a pretty standard what I like to call easy sort of like stage two, stage three potential you know endometriosis surgery. It's a uh, you know, you can see the anatomy pretty clearly. You're not getting crushed with uh, with bleeding or kissing ovaries or, or really there's no ureter in your way. Um, and, you know, the colon's not really involved, but certainly it's part of the rectovaginal septum uh, is clearly involved in this case as well as the uh, uterosacral, as well as the uterosacral ligaments. And, I'm, and again, I'm using a surge request here. I'm not really having a difficult time with um, smoke evacuation, and as the smoke gets evacuated, I'm not losing any pneumo, right? Nice plane in the rectovaginal septum there. All right, so that was what I like to call sort of an easy endometriosis resection, and we'll go to a, a little bit of a shorter video. Sometimes editing these videos is a little bit of a challenge because, you know, in a case like you're about to see, I'm taking uh, three and a half hours worth of actual surgery, and I've put it down to three minutes and 20 seconds worth of video. Um, so this will be a case, as you can see, this patient has a has a frozen pelvis. Everything there has moved out as far, you know, as far as it'll basically go for us without actually doing any dissection. Um, she has bilateral kissing endometriomas. You know, in these cases, we're going to want to, you know, vessel loop the ureters once we have them um, dissected out. And I think that's a critical part of doing these procedures. We're still on the left here. We've advanced a little bit uh, in the case, and you can see how how this case is certainly different from the other one. Um, you know, the, we're, we're cutting almost directly through uh, some incredibly tenacious um, scarred uh, tissue here in the left pararectal space that's kind of pulled the ureter towards it and pulled the left uh, pelvic sidewall peritoneum uh, really very close in towards it. So sometimes it becomes sort of a millimeter by millimeter um, battle, but I, I will I will share with you um, before we get to talking about Firefly, which is the next video. I will I will share with you that. Um, I, I was doing these cases with two, with you know two. And now we're on the right side here, so we you know a couple hours later. Um, so I did these cases with 2D laparoscopy uh, for a very long time. These advanced endo cases, and they would take me up to six or seven hours. Um, and I think my residents nobody liked standing there for six or seven hours. And now we're doing them with the Da Vinci. You can see the right ureter peristalsis nicely over there. Um, you know, now that we're, now I'm doing them with Da Vinci, and it's taking me for the for the most advanced cases, um, for the most difficult types of surgery. Um, it's taking me um, some time to uh, some time less to do these cases on the order of three to three and a half hours. Uh, so that's kind of more uh, more of the typical scenario. You know, I haven't been using, Dr. Walls asked a question, do I ever use ureteral catheters? You know, I haven't, um, but it seems I'm getting, it seems I'm getting more of these difficult cases that are coming towards me. Um, and uh, the, um, you know, Putting in a lighted stent has been a consideration. The urologists are very happy to come in and do it. It takes them no time. You know, I did it for a while, a very long time ago, when I was doing 2D laparoscopy, and I found what a lot of other surgeons found is that it can make the surgery even potentially a little more difficult. 
um, because you're not you're you're far less able to move the actual ureter around when you need to get behind it and underneath it. Um, now we're in the midline. I've got an EEA sizer here, and I've got my prograph sitting on the uh, um, colonic, you know, distal sigmoid colon serosa, and I'm just looking for the end of this lesion. And I know I'm about to get through, and the intention here is to get the entire lesion out. This patient turned out to have a through and through um, uh, distal sigmoid colon lesion. So I wound up going actually inside the colon, and we'll suture it up at the end of this video. Dr. Pack is, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, asked me how I prevent adhesions after, and now we're suturing this up and just finishing up the case. Um, she asked me how I um, prevent adhesions after removing all or what I will say most of the um, diseased peritoneum. You know, adhesions are, adhesions are, a, are a problem. Um, there's no question about it. But they're only a problem if the patients come back with either a bowel obstruction or some other issue. I, my, rate of, my rate of taking patients back to the operating room, doing these radical resections, and managing patients in a multimodal and multidisciplinary fashion is probably about one or two patients a year. And I don't really find that many adhesions in them. So to answer your question, Dr. Packers, I don't use any adhesion barriers other than the standard kind of things you do for surgery, which is excellent hemostasis and, and copious irrigation. Because even if, even, if my do patient, my, even if my patients are forming adhesions, which I have no doubt they are, I don't really think it's affecting their pain. Um, so that's why I don't really do it. So this is sort of the end of this case. Three, you know, three and a half hours later, we have a really nicely cleaned out pelvis, a, a closed colon, and it's, uh, it's really satisfying to be able to do one of these cases. Um, Dr. Saraf asked me the question, how frequently am I, gonna, am I performing such advanced stage cases? It's probably twice a month. Two to three times a month, we're you know trying to get busier in this area, but um, you know the vast majority of my cases are the are the ones like you saw in the first video. All right, so let's go on to talk about. Um, I think we're you know I don't want to get too short on time here. Let's go on to talk about Firefly. I think we'll go on to the back to the presentation here. Intuitive Surgical has provided us via the DaVinci SI platform an opportunity that I think that we should all potentially be taking advantage of. Um, Near-infrared uh, fluorescence imaging uses uh, a small molecule, a small compound rather called endocyanine green. It's a water-soluble dye and the way we're able to see it, which we'll, you'll see shortly, the way we're able to see it is Intuitive Surgical has integrated specific wavelength lasers to excite that dye up to a level that we can see and then it allows us, it, there are filters in the camera that allow us to look and be able to see that dye as a green dye. Um, it's a really, uh, it's, a, it's a very safe compound to use. It was first used to evaluate perfusion in 1976, and it's been used for a long time to measure cardiac output, fluorescence angiography. It's been used in hemodynamic monitoring. It's been used by the plastic surgeons to, for perfusion applications in flaps. Uh, and at NYU, um, the urologists have really pioneered the use of endocyanine green uh, and, da Vinci, uh, and Da Vinci's uh, fluorescence imaging technology for selective vessel clamping in partial nephrectomy. So there are a lot of really great uses for it. Again, as I said, it's a really safe molecule to give, has a nice favorable PK, it has almost complete binding to large plasma proteins, i.e. Um, albumin. Um, so the complete binding means that you're going to, means for your purposes, you're going to see a lot of it very quickly um, in, in small vessels. Um, it has a very quick half-life and, and then it's gone fairly, uh, you know, fairly soon. So I'll give you the kind of backstory to this this endometriosis, um, this sort of me wanting to look at endometriosis and endocyanine green. Um, I have a really nice relationship, as I said earlier, with the urologist and colorectal surgeon. So I was sitting with the urologist, Mike Stifelman, um, who kind of developed this this looking at the uh, partial nephrectomies with ICG. And we were kind of talking, he explained it to me, and I did, you know, the, the concept made sense to me. <laughs> but I kind of wanted to see green in my own operating room, and I wanted to find an application for it. Um, and, I, and I think I have found an application for it. It turns out that endometriosis is a highly vascular disease. Without, endometri without angiogenesis, endometriosis really can't move forward. It can't proliferate. And that makes it really nice to be able to see it with ICG. One of the things everyone on this webinar I'm sure has noticed is that the lesions are heterogeneous. We see brown lesions, we see black lesions, we see white lesions, we see what appear to us to be vascular lesions, but what we don't always see around those lesions are the subtle vascular areas, and I'm going to show you those today. 
I think that we can take advantage of the natural hypervascularity of endometriosis by using endocyanine green to better image what needs to come out and also better, Im better image what doesn't necessarily need to come out. So I'm going to call this sort of like the obvious endometriosis um, video. It's sort of really hard to miss this. I mean, experienced endometriosis surgeons will, will certainly not miss this lesion, will certainly not miss this, this powder burn black lesion, and probably won't miss this subtly hypervascular area over the distal sigmoid colon or really over the peritoneal reflection. Probably will not miss these hypervascular areas. Um, so, you know, this was this is sort of a proof of something like a proof of concept. Can we identify endometriosis lesions? And I I expect to see endocyanine green um, in areas where there's hypervascularity. I don't expect necessarily to see it in scarred areas where there's no hypervascularity. Switching over to fly or fi Firefly with your Da Vinci SI system is very very easy. It's a it's a pedal and a button. This is what you see when you switch over. Um, and there's no endocyanine green that's been given, basically nothing, just a gray, sort of like grayscale image um, that doesn't give you much of anything. Certainly shouldn't be used throughout your surgery and certainly should not be used for diagnostic purposes once you've, inject, once you've injected the ICG, then it's useful. Um, we give as a standard dose 5 milligrams, which is another research question of kind of how much should we be giving based on body mass index, hematocrit, etc. And you'll see, it, I tend to see that it tends to come first to the left uterine artery, and you'll see it more on the left side. But I don't think anyone's surprised to see this area of more hypervascular than, the, than some of the surrounding peritoneum, certainly peritoneum up here, peritoneum down here, because, you know, it's around an endometriosis lesion. But my question, you know, and, you know, I don't think we put this up as an actual question, but would you have resected all of this or only part of it? Think about that for yourself. Um, would you have resected that wide area or would you have gone, need that arrow back, would you have gone to resect um, just that small, um, just that small lesion and kind of the same thing over here, would you have just resected that or would you have gone further to dissect that more hypervascular area around it which probably represents vascular extension of endometriosis. And, I, and as we move kind of through our thinking and research and development and understanding of of how we're going to use Firefly and endocyanine green in the in the future, I think we have those are some of the critical questions that I think we have to that we have to be able to pose to each other. All right, let's go to the next video. So the next video, and you don't answer that question until you kind of get to the end of this video. Um, but the next video I'm going to call sort of more subtle endometriosis. Who sees endometriosis here? Again, this is a rhetorical question. Um, it's not so obvious that this patient has endometriosis, and I think a lot of people, at least with 2D laparoscopy, if they weren't able to see subtle surface changes, would probably, other than this area, kind of over here, um, might, sort of that area that I just pointed out over there, um, cause some issues. Um, somebody asked the question, are there dye allergy concerns? Um, there aren't dye allergy concerns. If somebody, the only allergy concern with this, um, if somebody has a, an, an, al an existing allerg known allergy to iodine, um, that's the only that's the only concern. But otherwise, no. <clears throat> um, so again, here switching over to Firefly. Now ask. Now you can see. Now you can answer the question. Um, once the fire, give it one second till the fire till the ICG is actually in. Do you clearly see a difference between left and right fluorescence? And that's why I think a video like this is sort of important for people to see who are considering using this, because there's clearly a difference between, Dr. Rossi, I'm going to answer your question at the end here, I promise. Um, so, and I will talk about the uterus also. So clearly to me, there's a difference between certainly normal peritoneum over here, kind of out here and maybe over here, and what's obviously vascular here. And that's, that's an area that I like to call, or that I like to term, um, fluorescent convalescence or fluorescent confluence. So you're, so you're not actually seeing these nice, pretty, clean peritoneal vessels that you see in normal peritoneum. Nice, pretty, clean peritoneal vessels surrounded by gray peritoneal tissue. And then what you're seeing is, oh, yes, there's some nice normal vessels here, but you look at this vascular confluence. And, and, same, and same kind of concept over here in the ovarian fossa. And that, to me, is, 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 is striking. Um, that there's a very clear difference. And it sounds like there are some people here saying, yeah, I can see, clearly see a difference here between uh, left and right. 
there's a lot of questions here. I'm going to try to, uh, I don't, we haven't tried to desensitize anyone. We just don't give it, Dr. Hoganson. Um, adenomyoma is coming up in just a second, and we'll show you how it looks uh, with adenomyosis. Dr. Bray, we start off with a 12 millimeter scope, um, and I don't know, we've had some, we've had some uh, light intensity issues with the eight and a half millimeter scope, so I, I tend to stick with the 12. Um, Dr. Uh, Weyhausen, I'm going to try to answer that again at the end of the um, at the end of the conversation here. So it looks like most people that are answering the question, um, we'll wait for a few more people um, kind of answer there. But so now let's go back to the to the white light. Now does it look like endometriosis? So now I can kind of see a difference. So I, not only have I sort of um, now have a, I sort of kind of learned something about what normal and abnormal tissue look like. Um, I've been able to use Firefly to help me identify um, areas. Dr. Weyhausen, you have another question there, and I like it. Yeah, and not only do a lot of patients have um, hypervascularity in the round ligaments, but they also mostly have hypervascularity right in the fallopian tubes. So you're going to see that hypervascularity in the fallopian tubes, and that should be considered, for the most part, normal unless you have something else to identify that um, is normal. Dr. Thompson, the Allen Masters defects um, typically do show green, and we're going to and Again, sort of a research question for the end. So while I, so I, while I see a lot of questions out there, I'm going to move on, and hopefully we can get those answered um, at the end. You want to move on to the next video? Now, someone asked a question about the uterus and adenomyosis. You know, maybe in the future we'll be able to identify, let's see if that video comes up here. There we go. And maybe in the future, this is a short one, in the future we'll be able to identify um, adenomyosis with Firefly as sort of another diagnostic tool. I was so impressed. This ICG not only, this patient's uterus not only lit up so incredibly brightly, but it stuck around, stuck, it stuck around for a much longer period of time than I would have expected the ICG. I, mean, I went back and looked like 15 minutes later and it was still there. Um, she had a 1.8 centimeter junctional zone on her MRI. So I wasn't surprised that she had adenomyosis, I was just surprised to see the, the endocyanine green stick around that long. And I suspect it's probably sitting in some, you know, venous lakes or vascular lakes in, in the myometrium. And I think that's probably why we see that appearance. So let me kind of, you know, move through the, the some of the data. Uh, initially, I collected data and we lab, kind of labeled the specimens carefully and went back and kind of looked at some of this and developed some basic numbers um, out of it. So just some of the preliminary data, we looked at, you know, can I looked at 14 patients. Um, we had a total of 71 specimens uh, from those patients. Um, in typical grouping of the RAFS stages uh, that we'd find in a you know sort of like classic what I take to the operating room. Again, I won't give it to anyone with obvious advanced deep infiltrating disease. And you know just big picture overall, um, Firefly or no Firefly, about 80% of the specimens were positive. So. This is what I got visually. This is Ken Levy, visual diagnosis with only the aid of 3D HD Da Vinci technology. Um, I was able to get with just visual diagnosis a positive predictive value of almost 82%. Um, what really stunk here was my negative predictive value, so I was probably um, well, I was probably leaving lesions that, that potentially should have been removed. It's not a bad sensitivity, but I'd, li I'd kind of like to see this get better, and I think it got a lot better when I added um, endocyanine green and near infrared uh, fluorescence imaging to my uh, to my regimen. Um, suddenly, my positive predictive value goes up to 90%. But what's really critical here, and what's really important, is that my negative predictive value is 90%. So that says to me, about 90% of the time, if 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 it's ICG normal, in other words, no no confluence and nice crisp vessels and a gray peritoneum, there's a there's a 90% chance there's no endometriosis there which helps me cut down on the amount of tissue that I'm removing. What's really important is that 16, and this goes to the NPV question, 16 specimens that were visually negative but were ICG positive, 11 of them demonstrated histopathologically positive for endometrial glands and stroma, which is how we, which is how we make 100% of our diagnosis. We don't take anything other than glands and stroma. So, so, so there, you know, this is young. This is new. We're all just starting to use this technology. So there are some critical questions that I hope I've sparked some interest in doing a little bit of research out there in ICG and endometriosis. The first big question, what we don't really 100% know, are what are normal and abnormal levels of, of fluorescence for various tissue types? And that probably varies by body mass index, you know, 
hemoglobin levels, hematocrit levels, um, uh, thickness of tissue, thickness of endometriosis. It really depends on a number of different potential issues. Um, the next question is, can we detect lesions that we couldn't previously detect with the naked eye? How about lesions that we couldn't previously detect with 3D HD, which I think is very good for helping you view surface changes. A question that's critical to my practice is, does resecting only vascular lesions, which we would detect with ICG, give the same pain outcomes as resecting all lesions? In other words, kind of leaving those ICG negative lesions behind. Um, and then, you know, real big question is, what is the value of ICG in detecting endometriosis and in detecting normal tissue that appears abnormal? The negative predictive value question. So, you know, in conclusion, I would, you know, just kind of leave you with chronic pelvic pain is a very difficult problem to manage surgically and non-surgically. Choosing surgical candidates um, to treat for endometriosis must really be done with care. And I, I feel very strongly about this that the Da Vinci Surgical Assistant Platform is a very precise tool that, that will allow us, and as you get more experience with it, will allow for improved outcomes in the surgical management <clears throat> of endometriosis. So I thank you very much for listening um, and uh, sticking with me this long. Uh, for those of you who are still there, it looks like most people uh, are still around. Um, so uh, I will open up the floor now to questions. Uh, Claire? Yep, thank you, Dr. Levy. Uh, we will now open up the Q&A chat window, similar to the chat windows you've seen before, where you can type your questions that you may have. Dr. Levy will read the questions aloud and then respond. Back to you, Dr. Levy. Great. Thank you, Claire. So I think Dr. Zisso's question about how the path correlates, I hope we answered some of that. Um, kind of go through some of these questions that are existing as quickly as I can. Uh, Dr. Weyhausen asked, what's the dose we use? You know, I got this from the urologist. This is sort of handed to me. And uh, the standard, you know, it comes in a 25 milligram vial. You have your anesthesiologist mix uh, 10 cc of saline. So it gives you two and a half milligrams per cc and just give them IV push. You'll ask your anesthesiologist to give IV push. Um, two cc will give you five milligrams. And we've been using that for everyone. Sometimes we redose it. Um, I have a question from Drs. Putnam, Dignan Moore, and Bennett. Um, do you use uh, do you use this for utilizing? Uh, do I do I utilize this um, ICG technology for for sacral vessels specifically? I think you're referring to the middle sacral artery uh, and the venous plexus uh, overlying it. You know, I, I typically don't when I'm doing sacral copal plexes. Um, I, you know, I feel like I'm very, I'm fairly well able to see the uh, vascular structures, and and uh, so I haven't really used it for that application. But I, I, I see a very good reason to use it for that application. The problem is that you can't, you're not going to do your sacral copalpexy or your, um, or your uh, retroperitoneal dissection there with with the grayscale. So I think it might be a little bit difficult. Um, ICG, uh, Rita asked a question: How long does ICG last during a case? Again, you know, three to four minute half life. Um, three to four minute half life, and uh, and um, then it's then it's then it's sort of going away. Dr. Rossi, uh, um, I don't know if you're you're the actress, um, but uh, you asked you you corrected me, and you're right. You don't mix it with saline; you mix it with sterile water. And Dr. Rossi's correct about that. Uh, my error. Um, you know, I don't I don't do lymph node dissection, so um, you know I know that the oncologists. Um, have been uh, looking at it uh, for sentinel, sentinel node identification, um, but I, you know, I don't personally do lymph node dissection, so I don't really, I don't really use it. Yeah, Dr. Carnavali asked a question. Do I, did I ever feel when I first started using Firefly that it really wasn't adding anything to what I knew was there with 3D HD? Um, yeah, I, I, I did, and I, I actually did, and, and I, you know, I thought at the time that I, that I you know, was a highly experienced surgeon um, re resected, um, you know, in resecting endometriosis. But um, I, I think now that I've, that I've raised enough questions about the utility of ICG and that I'm, I'm now I'm able to see areas, I think the critical part for me was that I'm able to see areas now <clears throat> that look abnormal to me, um, that didn't look abnormal to me in the past. Um, and, you know, right, the critical question is how do you, how do you remove those areas? Um, how, how do you remove those areas and know that you're kind of getting what you need? Um, Dr. Weyhausen asked again, what are the, is there an analysis on the margins on pathology? No, we haven't done that yet. And that's an excellent, that's sort of an excellent protocol um, to uh, use. We don't have a prospective um, protocol 
for doing this yet, Dr. Z to, to address Dr. Zisso's question about whether or not ICG is available to all or just in a research protocol. I mean, it's an, it's an FDA-approved medication for um, detecting vascular, um, d d detecting blood vessels in laparoscopic surgery. So, you know, you don't really have to put it in a research protocol, but I, but I think, I think coming, going down the road, a lot of people are going to want to answer these questions um, before we decide whether or not it's a good idea to take out more or less, uh, more or less disease. Um, Dr. Pack has asked a question who's a, who's a reproductive endocrinologist. She asked, when the patients want fertility sparing surgery, are they pursuing IVF or are they able to conceive naturally? Yeah, usually um, these patients that are coming to me, you know, are, are having surgery for pain um, and they're not having endometriosis resection for, for purposes of conception. Certainly there are patients that I operate on that are able to conceive naturally after surgery, but a lot of the conversation that I have with patients when I first see them who are planning to get pregnant centers around how difficult it is to get pregnant while we're treating chronic pelvic pain, so I leave them, you know, I, I, I try to leave them a decision if they're planning to pursue IVF and pain's not really their big issue, then I ask them why, why would we do surgery in the first place. These are great questions. I'm trying to get to. Uh, I'm trying to get to all of them. Um, let's see. Let's see. Try, I'm trying to read all of them at the same time. Let's see. Um, Dr. Isaac asked a question in a non-fertility preserving case, which involves oophorectomies. If residual ovarian tissue remains as a consequence of extensive disease, do do you ever use an aromatase inhibitor or Lupron to kill the remaining ovarian tissue? It's sort of a multi-part question with a multi-complex answer, but, um, you know, I, I, I don't have any fantasies about the idea that um, some, of my, some of my patients, even you know, as hard as I try, are going to have some ovarian remnant syndrome. Um, this, is gonna, this happens to everyone, and if you do enough cases, you're going to get one, you know, one or two here and there that have an ovarian remnant. Um, I think in those cases, probably an aromatase inhibitor um, is your best bet. I, you know, we don't use GnRH agonists in our practice for anything other than correcting anemia preoperatively. We don't use it in our chronic pelvic pain patients. We've been able to do that for many years. Um, the second part of that answer is that I tend not to, and I've been, this has been for the last two to three years, we've been having so much success with this, with this deep radical resection and, and the multidisciplinary multimodal approach that we've essentially stopped removing ovaries from younger women. Um, so, and uh, Georgine Lamvu, who's, who some of you may know, presented some of this data um, at last year's AGL meeting, and uh, so that, that convinced me even more. We've still, um, we haven't had any patient, we haven't had a higher incidence of patients coming back with, with, with pelvic pain and needing re repeat surgery if they, uh, if they had their ovaries uh, left in. Um, so I think some of us need to really consider what our understanding of endometriosis is, and I, I think the biochemistry of endometriosis would dictate that we don't really need to remove the ovaries to make the pain better. Yeah, Dr. Zisso asks, uh, you know, an insightful question. Um, you know, I have some data that I'm happy to share. It's sort of taking, it would take me a long time to share what our, our outcomes data in the office, but uh, we have we have a, about a 90% uh, rate of you know patients getting greater than 70% relief in six to seven months. I know that's a lot of numbers, but that's uh, that's how the numbers kind of go. And you know I don't know if it's the endometriosis or the presarcoidectomy, which is what Dr. Zisso um, asked about whether or not it's the endometriosis or the presarcoidectomy that helps the patients' um, pain. I'm not 100% sure that that's um, that's uh, that's what we're, that we're ever going to find out about. And I think that kind of lends itself to the whole thinking about these multidisciplinary, multimodal approaches. We're throwing, you know, six or seven treatments into the mix and don't really know which one works, and I'm not so sure that it's completely important. Um, Dr. Pack said, my experience has been similar to yours as far as those patients that respond. He said, where do you go next with those patients that don't respond to surgical resection? Um, so that's a really good question. And uh, again, we, you know, we have a, we fortunately have a fairly low rate of those, but we definitely get patients that don't respond to surgical resection sometimes, and then we go back to kind of one of these idioms in medicine that says, well, if my treatment didn't work, the, the answer probably isn't to do a more aggressive treatment. The answer is probably to figure out what I missed, and often what we've, what we've, what we've missed is either a musculoskeletal problem. I find, and I'm, I'm going to look to put some of this data together, I find that a, 
about 15 to 20 percent of patients come back after surgery from endometriosis resection and will point to one very exact spot on their abdomen where they still have very severe pain and I bet a lot of you have experienced that. Um, it's not your endometriosis anymore. Those patients <clears throat> over time develop muscle memory and splinting and muscle spasm in those very specific areas. And if you just inject their abdominal wall, or if you have them do a little bit of sit-up called the Carnet test, do a little sit-up, have them you know, push on their abdominal wall. If their pain gets worse while they're doing a little sit-up or, or doesn't get better while they're doing a little sit-up, you probably have an abdominal wall problem. Put a little lidocaine in there. If their pain gets better, then you know your, your resection probably worked but you're left with a residual pain problem that now is their focus. So again, taking these care of these patients can be a little bit complex and a little bit difficult. Um, and you kind of have to pay attention to all these issues without putting your head sort of in the sand and uh, thinking about um, some other issues that you may have missed. I kind of like to educate people to sort of don't focus on the endometriosis, but focus on um, the bigger pain issue that these patients are really chronic pain patients and that endometriosis in and of itself is just a pain generator. What you're trying to do by removing the endometriosis is bring that pain generator below the threshold of what their pain, below what their current pain threshold is while you on the long term try to raise their pain threshold. So I see a lot of questions coming in. I hope I didn't spark any, <laughs> spark some thought there. Um, so, Dr. Carnavale asked a question. Um, any comment on recovery room pain management? I have had a couple. Of, I have a couple of real disasters of being unable to control their pain in the recovery room. I, I, this is a common experience. Um, this is a common experience uh, to me. I, um, you know, we have patients in my practice that come to me uh, opiate addicted or opiate ver or very opiate tolerant. And sometimes it can be difficult. We wind up going to third-line medications like dilaudid, IV, often in the recovery room. Um, we've had some good success uh, with um, uh, with uh, IV Tylenol, believe it or not, <clears throat> uh, as a first-line agent. And uh, you know, I would encourage people who have the opportunity at their institutions to consider, you know, recovery room acupuncture. We haven't been able to do that, but I think it's probably a good idea. The other thing that may potentially help this abdominal wall type pain in the recovery room, especially with these incisions, is a, considering tap blocks. Um, if your anesthesiologists are able to do that for you, it can be done in about five or 10 minutes. Um, Dr. Zisso asked the question about um, to what extent do you try to rule out the other uh, evil triplets of IC and IBS? I, I thought there was the evil twins, uh, Dr. Zisso, but uh, I, got, I get the evil, <laughs> the evil triplets reference. I like that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not, I don't think it's a matter of ruling it out. I think it's a matter of recognizing it. And uh, when it comes to interstitial cystitis or painful bladder syndrome, kind of recognizing it, knowing it's there um, and treating it. Um, I, I think a lot of, as far as irritable bowel syndrome is concerned, I, I don't have any doubt that irritable bowel syndrome exists. Um, I just think it's overdiagnosed. Um, and I think that for a large number of women with chronic pelvic pain in my practice who've come in with IBS diagnoses, um, a lot of that IBS, a lot of that IBS symptomology is related to chronic intraperitoneal inflammation secondary to endometriosis. Now, not all of it, but I think that's something to consider is that some of those IBS symptoms tend to disappear once we've resected the endometriosis. Um, so again, it's just sort of this complex multi-layer thinking about, you know, what's going on symptomatically um, and, uh, and how it's, um, you know, and, and how it's interacting with other diagnoses that patients might have. And, you know, as far as IC and PBS are concerned, you know, I would probably say that, um, yeah, it's definitely there and we definitely see a lot of patients with it and it may also well be overdiagnosed and people, my suspicion is that there's a lot of pelvic floor dysfunction that's being missed in the context of uh, irritable bowel syndrome, I'm sorry, of uh, IC and PBS. Um, and so Dr. Almandar has asked why we don't use GNRH agonists. You know, Dr. Almandar, I, I think th you know, the big reason we've, we've come away from using GNRH agonists is because we've had a lot of success not using them. Um, and, you know, I, part, part of the reason initially was many, many years ago, I realized that I had become a referral practice and a, and a lot of patients were coming into my practice um, having either failed GNRH agonists or, or just being really convinced that the side effects were too much for them, and I, and I tended to agree, so I started off by telling patients, don't worry, I won't give you, I won't even ask you to take GNRH agonists, and uh, then uh, that was sort of, the, uh, sort of the end of it. I realized we could do fine without it. 
Um, but uh, I, I think we're um, I think we're coming to the end of our time. I really thank everyone for uh, listening, and uh, I am uh, more than happy to. Uh, my email address was uh, on the last side of the presentation. I'm more than happy to to answer any questions, share information, uh, discuss patients over the telephone. And um, I look forward to uh, creating some uh, collegial relationships. So thank you very much again. Great. Thank you, Dr. Levy. And thank you to the audience for attending and asking such insightful questions. This webinar has been recorded and will be placed on the Da Vinci Surgery online community in about two to three weeks. I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you.